Morning, 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 everybody. How you doing? Welcome back to the Spurs Talk Show. I'm Sean Butler. Bugsy Malone is off in front, trying to chase the squirrels. She's never caught one yet. I'm not even sure what she would do if she actually managed to get hold of one. She'd probably ask them to play with her. Please play with me, Mr. Squirrel. <laughs> anyway, enough of that nonsense. How are you doing, guys? Welcome back. Please do me a favour. Smash the like button for me. Smash the subscribe button for me. Smash the notification bell. And of course, drop a comment on this particular news item. And I do really want to get your thoughts on this one because we're moving back into the ownership conversation. But there's a couple of new angles that are emerging that I want to get your thoughts on. Something called greenwashing, which we'll come to later in the video. So guys, um, a couple of days have passed since Manchester United had their deadline for interested parties to put in what's called, you know, essentially soft bids, right? So um, expressions of interest that have detail to them that are not binding, but that once those bids go in, then Manchester United can then open the books up to those parties to, for them to kind of audit and go through and um, and figure out you know which particular price point they want to make the official hard bid at later. And we were interested on this channel, or at least I was, around what that would look like. How many t how many consortiums or parties were going to you know put up or shut up? And would there be any chance for any of the unsuccessful parties to turn their attention to Tottenham? Now, if you remember, a year ago, not even, Chelsea went through a similar process. And as far as we were told, they, there was eight or nine different parties, consortiums, etc., private equity groups, whatever, that were putting in those soft bids. And in the end, Todd Bowley was the successful party. So Jim Ratcliffe, chairman and CEO, founder of Ineos Group, a chemical company, one of the largest chemical companies, and he is now one of the, if not the richest, wealthiest British man, um, was unsuccessful in the bid for Chelsea, a Manchester United fan through and through, and he's turned his attention to Manchester United. So we were thinking how many people would want to bid for what is arguably the biggest brand in football, if not globally, then at least in the Premier League, a Goliath of a football team, a sleeping giant, one that's just on the initial steps to get back to where they are or where they have been. Um, but with a lot of work to do around the stadium and the infrastructure and all of those things. And so it was really interesting that only two people, two parties bid, Ineos Group and the Emir of Qatar, a sovereign wealth fund um, out of the Middle East. Now it's unofficial, but yesterday there was a video dropped from, it was either the Emir of Qatar or it was a representative of him. And they were speaking in Arabic, I believe. And it was translated on Twitter as saying that they have won the bid, that it just hasn't been announced yet, but they are going to be taking over Manchester United and all things are going to be spectacular. You know, rumours emerging that they're going to rebuild Old Trafford to a 100,000 seater stadium. They're going to clear the debt and just go for it. And what a terrifying, daunting prospect it will be to compete with that kind of vast wealth and ambition if you're part of any of the other clubs that can't afford to do that sort of stuff. So it looks like Sir Jim Ratcliffe has been unsuccessful and Stan Collymore put out a, uh, a conversation, or well, he had a conversation saying, um, why wouldn't Sir Jim Ratcliffe turn his attention to Tottenham? He's 70, I know he's a Manchester United fan, but that didn't stop him from bidding for Chelsea last year. So there's no reason to think he wouldn't necessarily want to buy Tottenham. And maybe he doesn't want the pressure of having to deliver trophies every single year like he does at Manchester United but at Tottenham he could have a very quick lasting impact that would make him a legend 
because it would just take one or two trophies very quick, in quick succession, sorry, to cement him as, you know, uh, a more loved chairman than Daniel Levy. And there really isn't that much that's left to do apart from fill the team with, you know, talented players. So it's a logical argument. And look, for what it's worth, what I find interesting about it, the more you think about it, is he didn't want the majority, he didn't want to buy a Manchester United 100%. Part of his tactic was to just buy the majority and then allow the Glaziers to still have some kind of skin in the game, some ability to still milk that cash cow a little bit on there as they dilute themselves out. Whereas the Qatar bid was allegedly at about four billion pound just to come in and take over clean sweep, clean house. So what's interesting, first of all, is if it's true that four billion is the suggested bid, again, soft bid, not a hard bid, but pending going through the books, if four billion is the kind of suggested bid and that would be accepted, then how does that value Tottenham Hotspur? You know, it's difficult to really apprise valuations. I know everyone wants to take a stab at it, myself included, but at the end of the day, they're, whilst they're playing in the same league and they're of similar interest and activities, you know, the valuation of the stadium, the valuation of the debt, the valuation of the training facilities, the valuation of the playing squad, the amortization of those players and their contracts, the brand value, and in Tottenham's case, the planning permissions that they have for things going on around North London. All of those things are very specific, very unique, and will distort and skew the overall valuation quite significantly. So, you know, it's difficult to really put a finger on it, but it's nice to see that we have some sort of benchmark. Now, would Sir Jim Ratcliffe want to do something similar with Tottenham where he could take over the majority but also allow Daniel Levy to remain in place as a minority shareholder but that also could stay as a chairman or a, you know, a director of commercial activities? You know, there's lots of media reports suggesting that Tottenham aren't for sale but no quotes to, to substantiate it. And lots of other media um, reports saying that there is always a price and that, you know, Daniel Levy would be willing to, at the right price, but he also would want to stay on as a, uh, you know, as, as one of the directors that can continue to facilitate and continue to deliver his project that he hasn't finished yet. So... So maybe Sir Jim Ratcliffe could do something similar to that. The, the interesting thing that I can't figure out, guys, is why it is that Tottenham, the QSI bid, was limited, restricted to a minority stake because of their interest and uh, ownership of Paris Saint-Germain, which makes sense, right? The rule being you can't have majority ownership in two football clubs who may face each other in a European competition because there'd be a conflict of interest. It makes sense that way. And so, because QSI own Paris Saint-Germain, they wouldn't be able to bid for the full ownership of Tottenham as well, in case they come across each other in, in competitions. So Jim Ratcliffe owns Nice. He owns the majority of Nice Football Club. Ineos Group owns the majority of Nice Football Club. And yet he was allowed to bid for majority ownership of Manchester United, and he would be allowed to bid for majority ownership of Tottenham Hotspur. And the circumstances are identical to QSI. Right. Both teams are in League 1, both of the English teams are in the Premier League. There's just as much chance of Tottenham facing Nice as there is Manchester United facing Paris Saint-Germain you know, in isolation. So I don't understand why it is that Ineos Group can do it, but QSI can't. People that I've asked who are familiar with the rules say it's likely because Ineos Group would just have a different structure where there's a different person of significant control, which is called a PSC. And therefore, you're kind of circumventing the rules in terms of who has the controlling interest and, uh, and who's in charge of the two different businesses. But if that's the case, if it's that easy, why can't QSI 
do the same thing. No one can explain that to me. And I don't understand it myself. For what it's worth, whilst we're talking about QSI, the fact that the Emir of Qatar is going into Manchester United, uh, or, or likely to go into Manchester United, is a uh, was a potential banana skin for QSI coming into Tottenham because of those conflicts of interest and the relationships between the two parties there. How you know, how close are they? But apparently, according to again journalists that are familiar with the situation. They are, there is no overlap, there is no conflict, and so the Emir of Qatar buying Manchester United does not in any way preclude or discount the possibility of Tottenham uh, being, as of yet, still potentially having a minority ownership via, PS, uh, via QSI. So it's all very interesting. Still nothing concrete, nothing to confirm. But what I did want to ask you guys is, first and foremost... How do you feel about um, about Sir Jim Ratcliffe maybe coming in? There would be some level of debt attached to the, the bid from Sir Jim Ratcliffe. He would be using private equity, but I don't think it would be anything like to the same extent as the MSP Sports Capital bid. And if it was just to replace the debt, then again, I don't think it's necessarily a problem. Would you be okay with him coming in, taking control of and making his mark, having his stamp over the footballing side with his team of operators, whoever they are, and allowing Daniel Levy to stay in place to continue doing his commercial bits and pieces that, you know, that, that he would want to uh, participate in. Does four billion pounds ring true to you as a number that if Manchester United can get four billion quid out of Qatar with you know, all of the various strengths and weaknesses of that portfolio the stadium is in disrepair that needs to be rebuilt but the squad strength the brand all of those things probably outperforms Tottenham so does it give you a, a decent baseline do you think Tottenham could be bought for four billion if Manchester United could is Daniel Levy being greedy asking for more than that let me know your thoughts and the last question I want to ask you guys is about greenwashing now, I don't want to get stuck into this too much because I know it can trigger some people in the comments. And again, I'm just asking questions that I think should be asked. Sports washing is a, is a, a term that most of us will be very familiar with. We've heard it all about you know, the, World, the World Cup. We heard it nonstop. And that it's basically people with vast sums of money that come from certain areas of the, the globe where other areas of the globe look at and don't necessarily share cultural norms and you know, have the audacity or the, uh, the, the opinion, whatever, however you want to think of it, that their behaviour is not in line and not to the same standards, I guess, as, as how we think of ourselves, these moral superior beings from the West. Whatever you think about that, I'm not like one way or the other, but you've heard of sports washing, these people come in and they then use that vast wealth that they have to invest in local areas, to regenerate deprived areas within the countries where those moral opinions are stemming from and tried to kind of dilute that narrative. But have you heard of greenwashing? Greenwashing is the ecological equivalent of sports washing. It is a system where businesses that are owned by extremely wealthy people like Sir Jim Ratcliffe, who have made their wealth by being at the top end of very successful companies who have made their money by producing products that damage the environment significantly both in the manufacturing of those products and in the usage of those products later by the customers of that that company Ineos is a chemicals manufacturer anything and everything that that you can think of that damages the environment will have something that has been built by a company like Ineos <laughs> introduced into that supply chain at some point. Ineos is one of the largest carbon footprint in the world and is a great contributor to climate change. So if you are someone who has strong opinions about climate change, whether one way or the other, then you know, are you going to be okay with an owner who has made all that money 
by participating in that industry. Again, I'm not saying my opinion, I don't really have one that's that strong, but I'm putting it out there because some people will have strong opinions about these things. And again, it's a pick your poison. Like I'll always say, you're not gonna find a clean billionaire. Whichever one, you, whichever opportunity you think is the best fit for Tottenham will come with risk. And either there's currency risk, interest rate risk, exchange rate risk, in terms of debt leverage financing, or there's moral compromise risk when it comes to greenwashing or sports washing ownership. You know, at some point you have to shake hands with it, uh, pick your poison, let me know which one that is, and if you've even heard of greenwashing, are you, uh, are you more or less in favor of that than any particular other uh, type of ownership? The one thing I would say, guys, before I let you go is the fact that only two companies came in and bid for Manchester United, versus the eight or nine that were bidding for Chelsea. And most of those eight or nine were private equity and were, would have so much uh, or a significant amount of debt leveraged against Chelsea. To me, it tells you, I think makes it quite clear that there is a, there's a significant kind of shifting of the tides, changing of the winds when it comes to the economy. The headwinds ahead of us are pretty strong. And I think that the ability to finance debt with favorable terms is incredibly difficult. And I feel like I'm more convinced than ever that any potential bid that would come from a company like MSP Capital that would, that would add additional debt to our club is something to avoid. And if Manchester United can only find two bidders that are willing to, uh, to invest, what does that say about the environment? There is a reason why the Glaciers are looking to leave. There was a reason why FSG were looking to leave, although they now apparently are less willing to, uh, to leave and saying that the club's not for sale. But I think it's because potentially it's gonna be difficult for people to find the, the price points that they were hoping for. And uh, you know, it's more difficult than ever to, uh, to milk that cash cow for all it's worth. We'll keep, we'll keep digging guys. Like, share and subscribe. I'll see you on the next one as always. Bye bye.